Good morning. Good morning. Wow. Yes, actually, my wife Dawn is the senior pastor of Whole Boulder now, and so uh, much like George and Joyce, um, on Sundays um, I am just uh, I am just a faithful, loyal church member, and uh, my wife is a wonderful pastor. Well, uh, my theme this morning is pray for laborers for the end time harvest, and I have just. Uh, four points that I wanted to communicate. If you're taking notes, four simple points on this. I'm going to use PowerPoint. I'm going to use PowerPoint, and I'm using this in hopes that my message will have one of the two, at least power or a point, that we would get from this. And so uh, let's take a second to imagine something, though, first. Imagine, imagine that you're a landowner in, in the rural area. So you're a landowner and you're a farmer of crops. Imagine that you have many fields in many places and you own it all. You oversee all of the workers that are there. Now imagine that this is one of your fields. So here's one of your fields and as you can see, it looks like it's going pretty well. You've got workers out there, they're bringing it in. Now imagine that this is one of your other fields. Endless seed, in this case of wheat, with no workers. Now again, imagining that you're the boss. You get to make all the calls. You get to do whatever you need to do. Remembering that all crops, they do ripen, and eventually they will spoil if they're not harvested. So if you were working this, if you were running this outfit, and you had all the workers in one, and nobody here, what would you do? You, you would certainly take some of the workers from the other place, and you'd say, hey, you need to go over here. I was thinking about some of the things that workers might say if they were in that one field, the fun field with everybody, and they were asked to move to that field, I thought of a few things they might say. I can imagine a worker saying, I don't feel led to go there. Remember though, you're the boss, right? How about, boss, I'm not as good as a lot of the other workers. Should I bother with this? How about, you know, boss, I really like being around a lot of the other workers. It's a lot more fun. If I go to that field, it'll be lonely. That's kind of like a light bulb saying, I just want to be in this room, it's all lonely, it's so dark in here. How about this one? You can imagine a worker saying, wait, wait, wait. I thought only formally trained workers from wealthy, from wealthy fields could actually go to this. I don't know that I qualify to go there and I certainly can't afford it. Imagine saying that to your boss. How about, there's just too much here in our field currently. I, I can't go there. Or, I know that you ask us as workers and laborers to go to that field. I personally feel like I'm more of a, a foreman or superintendent material. <laughs> Are you looking for those? But you're the boss. Or in Bible terms, you're the boss of the harvest. You oversee this, and you have the right to move people wherever you would want. Does that kind of resonate now with that sense of you've got to move people where you've got to move them? So here's the famous verse. You've actually heard it a couple of times at this conference. Can we put up Matthew 9, Osborne? So it's Matthew chapter 9. I'll get started on it while it's coming up on the screen there. Oh, there it is. Okay. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Let's stop there for a second. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. He is 
the good shepherd, isn't he? And when the good shepherd sees sheep that are harassed and helpless, that is not okay. His heart is moved, filled with compassion. He's deeply touched, realizing that he is in one body at this time and only able to do a very little in one body. And he has a group of disciples, but again, there's very few, so he has a limited group, and yet here's this vast sea of humanity, harassed and helpless. So he has compassion, and in the middle of his compassion, he says what's next. He says to his disciples, let's go ahead and put the next one up, Osborne. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, I thought we're pastors and leaders. How about we do a Bible quiz today? Wouldn't that be fun? So uh, what we have here is huge multitude, harassed and helpless. Then the Lord says the harvest is great. Using the harvest terms, laborers are few. Therefore, what should we do? So what goes in the blank? Now, I didn't want to make it this hard. So we're going to do a multiple choice type of question. Is that okay? So, first of all, the harvest is great. Therefore, A, stop standing around and get out there. There's a lot of people. Or how about B? Therefore, theologically philosophize about how someone else needs to do something about this. Nice. <laughs> or is it answer C? Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers. I think I'm going to roll with C. <laughs> but let me just point out something. <coughs> this is counterintuitive. Let's go to our first point if we could. Our first point is the compassion of the Lord of the harvest. Remember, he was moved with compassion. The good shepherd... He sees. My question for you is, as you're an under-shepherd of the Good Shepherd, do you see through the eyes of the Good Shepherd? When you see a multitude that's harassed and helpless, do you see that as a bother? Do you see this as a burden? Do you see, look at all these people that are getting in my way? Or do you see with the compassion of the Good Shepherd? It's counterintuitive in an action-based world, at least in the States. I hear people say this, oh, there's a big disaster or there's racial unrest and tension. And then people say this nowadays. They say, we need more than your prayers. Have you ever heard that? That's great that you're going to pray whatever things you're going to, almost like that's symbolic. But we need real stuff now. We need somebody to get out there and do something and and in some ways, I agree. Somebody needs to take action. The problem is, unless I pray, I don't know what action to take. See, I'm waiting for my direction. So I think two things. One, that anybody that says we got to do more than pray is probably somebody who's never experienced the power of prayer. Because prayer changes everything. And secondly, could we be immediate, our first response is to go to our knees and pray because of compassion. Let's put the uh, next slide. Here it is. Here's two simple points about this. Uh, there it is. One, compassion causes action. When you are moved with compassion, you will do something. And secondly, prayer is the best first action. I realize I'm telling this to leaders and reminding you that what you already know is true. But I am also saying there's such a temptation in this world to become the sons of thunder, right? Let's just take it up and Jesus just torch those guys. Let's just fix everything. Or you end up creating your own Ishmael, if you will, by just jumping out in the flesh and doing something without going to the Lord first. So could I even talk about the compassion of the Lord of the harvest? And he says, pray. He says, pray for workers. And here I would just say, you pray as your first response to everything. Let's go to our second point. The calling of the Lord of the harvest. Okay, easy question. 
Do you believe that God answers prayer? Yes. Do you believe that sometimes you are the answer to the prayer? That's not always as easy, is it? You ever had somebody at your church and they're complaining about something or, or not, not complaining, I'm just saying it like it is, that we need to fix this and we got to get somebody to do it. You know what that sounds like, don't you? That's a call to ministry right there. Sometimes criticisms and complaints are calls to ministry. And sometimes we become the answer to our own prayer. But I would also just like to say this. And this is very simple, but, but I will tell you, this will change the nations, especially in light of what you heard Pastor George Petron talk about, this global prayer network. Remember the fields. It's the Lord of the harvest that calls people. I'm not a recruiter for the Lord. The Holy Spirit is. And when we see something, then we are praying, and we are asking the Lord of the harvest to call or send workers. But here's something that I have noticed. In many parts of the world, we do not see ourselves as a possible answer. Remember when I talked about the fields before and the farmers? That people feel like, well, that's certainly not me. There's other people more qualified. There's other people from other places that could do it better or have the resources. But can I just say this? That's not your call. That's the Lord of the Harvest's decision, isn't it? And if the Lord of the Harvest calls, what do you do but answer We'll talk more about that in a minute. Who qualifies? Who qualifies? The reason I'm bringing this up is, as we're praying for laborers, and my hope is, as a result of even today, that you get this nice reminder that says, wherever you are, if you're on the tour today, and you see people, you see a problem, you see a, a group of young people that look like they're up to no good, you see a group of old people that look like they're up to no good, whatever it is, that your first inclination would be to go, oh, I wonder what they're doing. But right away, you just go, Lord, send laborers. You can't get to everything. You can't feel that burden of fixing the world. You're not the Savior. What he said to do there is, is when your heart feels the compassion and the load, first response is, just pray. Lord, send somebody. But then you got to realize that somebody else is praying that prayer, and the Lord of the harvest is looking at you and saying, I'm going to move you over there. That's why I needed you to see this, because you cannot right out of hand see yourself as not qualified for the Lord of the harvest. So I'm going to run through three verses real quick that you know, but I want to stack them together real quick. So, first of all, Matthew 28, Jesus came and said to them, all authority and in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In other words, I have all the authority and nobody else has the authority. I have it all. So I'm telling you, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay, now let's go to Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, or in other words, where you're at right now, Judea, that surrounding area, Samaria, those people that are geographically close but culturally distant. The people that you refer to as, oh, those people. The people that you have racial tension with amongst your people. And he calls you to go to Samaria. And he gives you power and to the end of the earth. And then finally, <clears throat> Acts 2, 17 and 18. This is, of course, on the day of Pentecost. And this is picked up from Joel. Peter does this. But by the way, if you study the life of Sister McPherson, you know what you're going to find? This verse. When you talk about everybody being empowered and released in ministry, this was the verse that really propelled it. So let's read it. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. So what does this say to us? These three verses, can I say it this way? It is everyone going everywhere. It is all the nations going to all the nations. You are qualified to be called by the Lord of the harvest to be a laborer. And it is 
actually like a worker that says, I don't know if I'm called over there or there. It's actually not your job to talk to the Lord of the harvest and tell him what you what he ought to have you do. Right? It's yours to say, Lord, wherever you send me, I will go. We can even pray the missionary prayer a little later. Remember that where he leads me, I will follow. When he feeds me, I will swallow. And all those great prayers. Where it's his will, it's his will. We've got a bunch of them. This is a part of Foursquare history because if you listen to Sister McPherson's sermon, she had such a drivenness and a passion and an urgency, which we'll get to in a few minutes, that that verse just said, we got to get everybody out there. There's way too much harvest. We can't have half of the force be disqualified by somebody saying that women can't do this. We can't have the force disqualified because you're too young, you're too old, you're from here, you shouldn't be, or whatever it is. There was just such a desperation that just said, we ought to all go do this. I think she put it in simple terms, that you ought to go, and if you can't go, then you ought to fund somebody else who will. Of course, when you have the power of, your, of the Holy Spirit in your ministry, you can be demanding, can't you? And so, this idea that everyone can be qualified. One of the first four square missionaries from Los Angeles. Well, by the way, Sister McPherson, she was a Canadian. She preached with a Canadian accent, even. And then she ends up going... Thanks, Abe. Everybody say thanks, Abe. All right. She marries an Irishman, goes to Hong Kong. Come on, Hong Kong. All right. So there was this urgency to go. She saw this. And that's why you see Bible school students not even finishing the Bible school sometimes. You see, you see two girls or three girls from Bible school driving across the country and plant the church someplace. There was such a sense of whoever the Lord of the Harvest calls. And one of the first missionaries was actually a cook on a ship out Long Beach Harbor, listening to the radio, because he couldn't go and physically hear a woman preacher. So he heard her on the radio. And the rest is history as uh, Vincent DeFonte ends up being one of the first missionaries to go to his home, the Philippines. Most people feel like, well, if I'm a missionary, I gotta go someplace else. Let's hear it for the Philippines. This sense of this, we're going to talk about this. This will be this is point four. I'm getting ahead, but this is the urgency that drives the fourth square. The urgency that drives the fourth square is that the soon and coming king actually is the king and coming soon. There was a desperation that was there. It's us as senders and seeing ourselves as senders. And here's where I mean this about prayer. Before he calls the disciples, what was Jesus doing the whole night before? He was up praying all night. He knows these disciples, and he needs the right one. As Joyce referred to yesterday, when you've got when you're in front of the sons of Jesse, you don't want to pick wrong. You don't want to choose incorrectly, do you? Jesus is up all night saying, praying to the Father, and not just like you know, thirty seconds before the meal in the morning and saying, "I got a big day today. Help me choose the right people. Bless the food. Amen." But all night long praying. Think about Acts chapter 13. They were in that prayer meeting. Remember? And the Holy Spirit said, set aside Saul and Barnabas. You know, what's interesting is it doesn't have any indication that they knew who was going to get called before that. Or if anybody was. I mean, were they, were they all kneeling around and like, come, some of them were kneeling and going, pick me, pick me. And other ones were like, please no, don't, don't pick me, Lord. We don't know, but here's what we know is it was a time of fasting and prayer. And the Lord of the harvest said, okay, I'll take those two. And here's what we know is that group actually got to send their very best. They didn't send somebody who was like, you know, I don't know if they're going to make it around here locally. So yeah, let's send them. They sent what we call the a game because the Lord of the harvest called. Could we return to this style of sending people? Fasting and praying and letting the Lord of the harvest speak and say, I know you really needed them here, but the Lord of the harvest has spoken and I'm sending them there. Would we be okay with that? 
could we begin fasting and praying for workers again? God makes the unqualified qualified. Do you believe that a nine-year-old can be filled with the Holy Spirit and that she can go to school and win her friends? Do you believe that she can win her family? Do you believe that she can minister in the power of the Holy Spirit? Oh, wait, she's only nine. Can she do it? Yeah, okay, but this is an 86-year-old elderly man from a poor village. Could he be filled with the Holy Spirit and take the gospel someplace else? And could everybody in between? And younger and older? I know I'm speaking the obvious here, but I just wanted to get it through to us that the Lord of the Harvest is going to call, and we do not have the option to the boss to say, not me. <laughs> Pick somebody else. So there is a famous verse, and this is uh, part two of our Bible quiz. So let's put Isaiah 6, 8 up there. <clears throat> All right, here we go. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, blank. Let's go to multiple choice on this one. All right, here I am, A. Here I am, Lord, send that guy. B, here am I, but do we really need to send anyone anymore? And I like it here. Or C, Send me. Here, here I am, Lord. Isn't it interesting that calls like this happen in the presence of the Lord in the place of worship? Okay, here's our third point. It's the equipping of the Lord in the harvest. Here's my life-changing moment. My life-changing moment is that uh, before I spent my little summer in Japan, I... Um, I didn't know that churches supported missionaries. I was a new believer, and I just knew I was supposed to go and share Jesus someplace else. <clears throat> and so I went and got a job doing construction work. Now, in the United States, a construction laborer is a very low-paying job. It is very hard, manual work. You will get dirt under your fingernails, and it's called a laborer. When I first started, I had no construction skills at all. So they gave me just a little belt and a little tape measure and what we call, sorry, this won't translate well, but they gave me the daddy's little helper hammer. I mean, it was like just this, this this little thing that I couldn't hurt myself with. Because most of what I was doing was just packing things around as a laborer. But something happened. And I tell you, I, this affected my life. You see, the boss, the boss said, hey, you see that wood over there? He said, I need you to go cut it. I need you to go cut the boards. And right away in my mind, I was thinking, I have a tape measure and the daddy's little helper hammer. And as I was thinking that and thinking, how, how would I ever do this? Here it is. Here's a life-changing thing that my boss said to me. He said, hey, you can use my saw. That was it. Life changed. Hey, you can use my saw. Why? Because now I understand something. That when the boss tells you to do something, he will always make sure that you have the tools to do what the boss has asked you to do. This is the equipping of the Lord of the harvest. If the Lord sends you someplace and you think, well, Lord, how would I do this? You just have to know that if he calls you to do it, he will give you what you need to do what it is that you need to do. Now, on my old construction job site, sometimes I see these veteran, older men, and they have tools everywhere. They've got these bandoliers of tools hanging off and power tools every place. And when I, I thought, that's okay for the job site, but sometimes it seems like in the church that people want that. Like, I've got lots of gifts. I've done 18 assessments of gifts, and I have all these things. But can I tell you that the boss doesn't work that way usually? These tools that he gives you are to be used. And he'll just make sure that you have what you need when you need it. Amen? Now, I know when we talk about equipping that training and education are important. And certainly if you're called to go to Samaria or another language or another culture, that we would say, yes, training is important. But I do want to just remind you of this great verse in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Here it is. 
Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized what? That they had been with Jesus. The ultimate equipping for us to be a part, to be a laborer for God, is just as simple, that you've been with Jesus. Because the boss knows how to train you for where the boss has called you to go. Please don't hear this undermining the education that you might need someplace. But can I say this? All the education in the world and not enough time with Jesus, not going to work. We okay? Now let's go to point number four. The end time urgency of the Lord of the harvest. I grew up in the city in an urban area, but then in high school I moved to a rural community farming area. It was called Stanwood. And in Stanwood, not a big population, but uh, they grew uh, different uh, things like uh, green peas. They grew other things. And once a year at harvest time, there was zero, <clears throat> there was zero unemployment in my city. Everybody had a job. As a matter of fact, sometimes they were desperate and they lowered the standards of who ought to be working out there because they were so desperate to get more people out there. Why? Well, you get the idea that when you see your crops spoiling, when you know that you have to get them in and you're a boss and you're, running, you're overseeing all of this, you'll do whatever it takes to get all, this, all the crops in and your standard of who could be a worker tends to go down. There was zero unemployment because crops do ripen and they do spoil. This, if I could say, is that sense of urgency that has always propelled us. That urgency that realizes that people are lost and people do pass into eternity. And when compassion is mixed into this, it creates, if I could say this, a desperation. You know that you cannot manufacture desperation. You can't make desperation. But I will say that if you ask the Lord for it, He has a way to get it to you. That desperation. Because you realize, even today, there are billions of people that need to experience the love of Jesus. Somehow. On the streets, as Pastor Leslie was talking about his first night. That idea of just praying on the streets and just praying. If you don't know what to pray, then you can always pray to Matthew 9. Lord, send a worker to that house. Lord, send a worker to these people and believe that he'll answer the prayer. It's interesting in Acts chapter 2, where that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh was given. It was given on the day of Pentecost, remember? Now, if you know your Feast of Israel, Pentecost was the middle of the big three, right? Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. Pentecost was what they called the, the first fruits. This is when there was a rain that came down and helped to get the first crops to actually be ready and ripe for harvest. That's why it's referred to as, when we say early rain, this was the idea, is the early rain came down to get it started. Now we all know also there's something called a latter rain. That latter rain is right before the final harvest of the year. And that one's a big deal. That latter rain happens at what's called the Feast of Tabernacles. The ingathering. James 5, 7 even. It says, be patient therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer, we're back to farmers again. The farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until he receives the early and late rains. We believe that God is going to pour out His Spirit again, in a strong way like Pentecost, and we even experience that some of it's happening right now. But some places it doesn't seem to be. And so we pray, Lord, pour out your spirit again. Let there be a great rain, so there'd be a great harvest. But if there's going to be a great harvest, now we're back to the Lord of the harvest looking and saying, it's so great, laborers are so few. We put John 4.35 up there. Look at this. He says, 
Do not say there are yet four months, then come the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. You say it's in four months. You say someday it's going to happen. And I tell you, I love, don't you love that, that, that picture that it gives? Lift up your eyes. You're looking low. You're looking in a human way. It's ready right now. Lift up your eyes. And here's what else is interesting. Where did he say that? Where was Jesus at when he said that? He was in Samaria. Isn't that interesting? He was in the place of the woman at the well where the disciples came and said, wait a minute, why are you even talking to her? And by the way, Jesus, why are we even here? We usually go around this place. It's interesting that in the place where many in the culture said this place is lost and gone, that Jesus says, you guys aren't seeing it, it's right here. It's ready, right now. So may the Lord of the harvest, may he call us. May we be available to pray and have the boldness to obey. May we become people who our first action, our first right action is always prayer. And it's praying to the Lord of the harvest. When your heart gets overwhelmed and you feel uneasy because you don't know what to do, the first response is pray to the Lord of the harvest. What if you got the map back out in your office or in your room and you just start putting your hands on places in the world? What if when you saw people, they looked different than you, you were really interested and just in some way said, where are you from? And just learning about things and beginning to pray that God would send workers. In other words, let's take this out of the human endeavor of reaching the world and turn this into the spirit-led endeavor of we are all on God's mission with him. He's the Lord of the harvest and he will lead us. I want to pray for you. That be okay? And then we're going to go to our discussion groups. Lord of the harvest, we cry out to you. Our hearts are moved with compassion for everything in this world. Disasters and, and lostness and peril and in so many places it seems dark and even hopeless. But Lord, let not our hearts become overwhelmed or us being paralyzed with all of this heaviness. But instead, we turn to you, the Lord of the harvest, because you oversee all the fields and you oversee all the workers. And we're asking that you would send forth laborers. Lord, that you call laborers and that we would be open if we're supposed to be the answer to that. Lord, that we get the prayer meetings going again with that idea of, Lord, who here would you want to send out? And then, Lord, we would be people of continual prayer, asking for laborers even more as we see this harvest ripening. Just like in Stanwood, where there's that desperation, we've got it, we're going to lose this. But Lord, let there be a renewed, rekindled sense of desperation in us for the harvest. Not, not out of guilt that we got to just, just go stay up later and go do more in the flesh. But actually that we would first just go to you and pray. Let it happen throughout Asia, Lord. Let it happen here. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Um, they, they asked me to write a paper about this, and I don't know how good it is, but I wrote a paper on this that has some of the four points of this. It has my stories in it. You're welcome to have it and change into your stories, or you can just use mine and change my name out, whatever you'd like to do. But, uh, uh, and uh, I think the next slide, Osborne, if you could, is uh, if you want that paper, then Wileen can email it to you if you just write to uh, her at the top email, or you can write to me. Be happy to share it with you, and then at the end of it are the discussion questions for our groups. So um, if you go ahead and go one more, I have four discussion questions, and uh, I'll turn it over to you, Pastor Sam, to uh, to send everybody on their on their ways. But uh, you'll see uh, you'll see four four questions. Sam, thank you guys. God bless you. <laughs>